Welcome to today's webinar, Breaking the Stigma Around Dementia. I'm your host, Jana Parker Evans. And dementia is a difficult diagnosis for a family to go through. But future breakthroughs may bring hope to patients and families. So join us today for a conversation about recent research and advancements in the field. All right, let's jump in and meet our speaker, Dr. Heather Snyder. Hello, Dr. Snyder. Hi there. Hi there. As Vice President, Medical and Scientific Relations at the Alzheimer's Association, Dr. Heather Snyder oversees initiatives that accelerate innovative Alzheimer's research and provide opportunities for the global dementia community to connect and collaborate. She leads the association's International Research Grant Program, which is the vehicle through which the association funds promising investigations that advance understanding of Alzheimer's and move the field towards solutions to the global Alzheimer's crisis. So to kick it off, Dr. Snyder, Alzheimer's is a really difficult diagnosis. What new advancements are giving hope to families who are living with Alzheimer's? Yeah, no, thank you so much, Janet, for hosting today and for having us to Brookdale for bringing this webinar together, but really for all of you that are joining us today. And um, Janet's question is, is one I think all of us ask, especially for those of us that have personally gone through this journey. So I thought I would maybe start with just a, a few slides, a short, a short presentation to not over, over, uh, uh, overdo it with uh, the discussion, because we want to make sure we have lots of time for discussion. So hopefully you can all now see my slides quite clearly and, and you're able to, uh, to see them. And so it's really a pleasure to be here with all of you. And uh, as Janet said, I am the Vice President of Medical and Scientific Relations at the Alzheimer's Association. So did want to start by just sharing a little bit with you about who the Alzheimer's Association is. We are the world's largest voluntary health organization dedicated to Alzheimer's and all other dementia. Uh, we have a vision of a world without Alzheimer's disease. I do want to note that we have a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week 52 weeks a year helpline for families and individuals that have questions about how to navigate circumstances. And you can see that number here because I do think that's such an important resource for so many of us. So within the Alzheimer's Association, we have services and resources within communities all across the country. I saw in the chat, so many of you are joining, some from Montana, from Kansas, as well as Minnesota and, and many other places, Texas. Uh, and there are resources in your community, whether it be the Alzheimer's Association or other resources, that if this is a journey that you're on right now with somebody in your life as a caregiver, if it's a journey you're experiencing or have experienced, there are resources or opportunities to get engaged in your community, maybe advocate, raise awareness, uh, or tell your story, all of which are incredibly important. So I did want to make sure to mention those, research, those resources. Now, at the Alzheimer's Association, we have an, also a big part of our, our work is focused on research and, and the work that we do on research. And so I wanted to spend, because of the role that I play, a little bit of time talking about our research strategy in the context of where research is going. So at the Alzheimer's Association, we look at where are opportunities for us to seed new ideas, to speed things forward for both the development of new therapies, but also tools for early and accurate diagnosis. How can we scale things up so that they're accessible broadly in all communities? And part of that, I mentioned previously, one of the things we can all do is we can advocate. One of the things that we are very active in with our, our public policy arm, the Alzheimer's Impact Movement, is advocating for increased research, research resources at the federal level. And we've been incredibly successful. Our advocates are amazing at telling their stories and sharing how the need to increase research funding is gonna allow us to get ahead of this disease, to understand the biology, to have new ways of detecting those earliest changes, early and accurate diagnosis, how that will build us into a, a broad and diverse pipeline of possible clinical trials and thinking about ultimately risk reduction and prevention across the board. The Alzheimer's Association also has a large portfolio of funded research uh, of Alzheimer's and all dementia research with around $310 million that's active in 48 countries. So one of the big questions I often get is, how is the global community working together? So everything I'm gonna talk about today is really that global community continuing to come together, share information, share ideas, and, and move us forward as fast as we possibly can. For any of us that have lived this journey, we know we, we needed to be there yesterday or, or 
you know, long before. But we are moving in that direction, and there's a, a tremendous amount of momentum. So what are the facts? Where are the numbers? What do we know? Uh, just a few that I, I know often resonate with so many of us. There are more than 6 million Americans today that are living with Alzheimer's disease. There are over 11 million individuals uh, that are providing care and support for somebody with Alzheimer's or another dementia. And what we have seen is we've also seen that deaths due to Alzheimer's have significantly increased in recent years. I often get a question as to why, and there are maybe a lot of different reasons. One is maybe a greater awareness, but also one is that we're, as a society, living longer, and we have the baby boomer population, which is really into that overage, moving into that over age 65 now at this point in time. So the, the numbers of individuals that may be at, at increased risk are also increasing uh, for this as age is the greatest risk factor. So I've already used some of these terms inter interchangeably, so I did want to set the stage a little bit. We often talk about Alzheimer's and we often talk about dementia. And so I'll sometimes have people say, well, I didn't have Alzheimer's I, or, or my mom didn't have this, she had dementia. Uh, or she had this type of, of, she had Lewy body dementia and that's very, you know, that's very different. And so I wanted to just set the stage. Dementia is that umbrella term. It's really describing the symptoms a person is, ex is experiencing, those changes in memory, thinking, and reasoning. And there are different causes of dementia. So Alzheimer's is a cause of dementia, vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, frontal temporal dementia, and each of these causes of those symptoms that a person may be experiencing are really defined by specific biology. So we often will say cancer, well what kind? There might be breast cancer or bone cancer or lung cancer, and those are defined somewhat by the biology but also the location of, of where they may be. Dementia is the umbrella term, and then the cause Alzheimer's, vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, frontal temporal dementia, there are other causes. And increasingly, we understand that some people may have multiple causes or multiple brain changes that are contributing to their memory changes as well. And it's this increased understanding about that biology, about what's happening, that is really driving investigation of what might be the biology, what are the biological underpinnings. And the goal is that can inform us in interventions, that can inform us with those diagnostic tools for the most early and accurate. So in Alzheimer's disease, we often talk about beta amyloid and tau because those are two of the hallmark brain changes that we see present. So we see large clumps of proteins between the brain cells. Those are known as plaques. And the primary component of those is beta amyloid. We also see clumps of proteins within the brain cells. The primary component of those is known as tau. Now, tau is also in those clumps that happen within the brain cells. That's actually a brain change that we also see in Lewy body dementias, frontal temporal dementia as well. But in Alzheimer's, there is much more happening. We also see changes in the immune system and neuroinflammation in the brain, the way the vascular system is responding, both the, the flow of blood, but also the strength of the blood vessels within the brain, the way the brain is making or breaking down energy or food processes for its energy and its everyday process. Neurotransmitters, really that cell-to-cell -cell communication and how the brain cells are talking to one another. And so these are just some of the brain changes that we see in Alzheimer's, as well as some of these other dementias that are informing what the symptoms a person may be experiencing throughout the disease progression. So when I talk about disease progression, what does that mean? Well, for a long time, we really talked about Alzheimer's disease as the, the more significant memory changes that impacted a daily life. And we, we now understand Alzheimer's is more of a continuum, that there is a window of time where someone may have early memory changes that are due to the underlying biology. That might be called mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's. But there could also be a window of time where somebody may have no, no noticeable cognitive symptoms, but the underlying biology may be changing. And this is because the research is telling us that the brain changes may begin 20, or more, 20 years or more before symptoms appear. So think about heart disease, right? We know when you go to your healthcare provider, they're going to check your blood pressure, your cholesterol. Those are actually markers of our underlying biology. Those are markers of things that may be putting at us at an increased risk. We're on that continuum of heart disease, and they may be putting us at an increased risk for a heart attack or stroke in later life. And there are things that our healthcare provider might tell us lifestyle interventions, medications, but more likely combinations of approaches that will change that trajectory. Can we think about Alzheimer's in that same kind of way, where you are maybe on that continuum with the biology, where we can intervene at an earlier time point and change that trajectory? And so there's a lot of work going on in this particular area in this space. 
Now, one of the, the things that's really advanced this area has been biomarkers, this idea of these tools that allow us in a living person to see what are those earliest changes. So our, our brains are a very protected organ, and it's not quite something you can just open up and take a look at what might be going on. So the field has been very creative with funding from the Alzheimer's Association, as well as with the federal funding that has been made possible with tools like, can you take a, a picture of the brain and see some of these brain changes in a living person over time? And while that has been incredible and in, in informing the work that we're doing, and also has been really instrumental in moving trials forward, and for individuals that may present in, an, a, in a way that's not what you might typically expect, maybe younger in age, and other specific instances, imaging is really valuable at increasing the certainty of a diagnosis. And we do know that an accurate or when there's an increased certainty of a diagnosis, that may change or impact care plans. But ultimately, we want something that's lower cost and more readily uh, available in clinicians' offices that can then identify who should go for that more invasive uh, and more expensive procedure. So something like a blood test, or can we use our eyes as a window into what's happening in the brain? I uh, just heard uh, right before this call that there was a, there was a large article or a, an article in the Washington Post, and I think it was in a couple other places, around where we are in blood tests. And there's a lot of work happening. There is a lot of exciting work happening and moving us forward into when they will be ready for prime time. Now, we're not quite there. There are a couple tests that are available from a provider. A provider could order them to increase the certainty of a diagnosis or to inform their diagnostic workup. But it's important to note that they're not necessarily um, validated in large and diverse populations. And so that's coming, though. Where we are seeing these tools, we are seeing them being incorporated into clinical trials. They're part of what might be um, evaluating whether somebody has the biology and then going for that more invasive test, like an image, to say, okay, they have the biology, we're looking to target, they're ready for a clinical trial. And so that's really exciting and allows us to validate in much larger and more diverse populations at a, at a faster time period. So in that idea, where are we with clinical trials? And, and one of the things, and don't try to memorize this, each of these pictures on this graph, because I think what, it, what I really want you to take away from this is this walks you through the different stages, phase one, which is looking at safety, phase two, which is looking at safety but also dose, and phase three that's looking at is it effective. What I want you to really take away from this is just the numbers of trials. And, you know, this is a, an incredible growth year over year. We're seeing more and more unique therapies or new therapies moving into the pipeline of what's being explored for Alzheimer's. The Alzheimer's Association has been a large funder of a number of these to move them from the bench, these ideas, over into clinical trials. And in fact, what we are also seeing as we understand more and more about the biology, the opportunity to leverage things that have been actually developed for other diseases and bringing them into Alzheimer's and dementia and, and exploring them as possible therapies. So the big takeaway here is there's a lot of momentum. We're not where we want to get to. We need to continue to increase this pipeline and the diversity. There's a lot going on in this biology. The idea of possible combination approaches is really where the field is thinking. What might be the biology in a given person? And how do we, how do we target that biology to slow or, or stop that progression overall? So where are we today in, in terms of, of treatments? There are several uh, medications that have been approved uh, by the FDA. Many of them are symptomatic, meaning that they're addressing the underlying symptoms. In 2021, we had the first drug that was approved by the FDA called aducanumab or Adjahelm that targets the underlying biology, so a little bit different in, in its approach with the idea that it has a reasonable likelihood for clinical benefit. Now, many of you may be aware or familiar with this, as it did make a lot of headlines. Uh, there is some challenges in terms of accessibility and availability of this drug, and there are uh, safety considerations to, uh, to have uh, that conversation with your healthcare provider. But I think what I really want to talk about is that recently in September and then in 2023, there are other drugs that are targeting beta amyloid that are a little bit different, that are, for instance, lecanemab which reported out in September top-line results demonstrating a positive phase three trial. Now, we'll see more data in a couple weeks about this particular trial and the particular work that they've done at whether they were able to, they did in their uh, top-line results, they did say they were able to lower beta amyloid effectively, and then they saw a clinical benefit, a slowing of, of clinical decline in the individuals. 
There is another drug also targeting beta amyloid called denanumab that's in late stage development, expected to report out in early 2023, uh, and that is also targeting beta amyloid. I do want to note that while these three are targeting the same biology, they're all in late stage development. And that graph that I just showed you, it's really the diversity of things that are looking at metabolism and the immune system and tau and some of these other biologies, the vasculature, that we're seeing moving through that same pipeline. And these three, while they're all targeting beta amyloid, they're all a little bit different in the biology of, of what they're actually targeting. So these are really exciting to see move forward, but there are this over 140 other things that are in clinical development that are targeting multiple aspects of the biology as well. Because it's this idea that there's this underlying biology, there are different brain changes that are happening in an, in an individual, beta amyloid and tau are just two of them, there's also changes in immune system, how the brain cells are, are talking to each other, the vascular changes, and so many others. These tools, such as taking a picture of the brain, looking in our blood, looking in other ways to understand what's the biology in a given person, will inform where we might be on that continuum. And then ultimately, having different interventions that allow us to intervene throughout this entire continuum, and putting that in the context as we think about risk reduction. What might be those factors that individually we could modify to reduce or impact our risk overall. And there's a lot of really exciting work going on in that space as well. And so where we are in the field, it's this intersection of where treatment, care, and research come together. And it's really an exciting time as we enter this new phase. I know for any of us that are, are living this journey, it's, a, it's challenging because we want to be further down the road. There's a lot of momentum. There's a lot of hope going forward. We're not where we ultimately want to be, but we're moving in that direction. So really, uh, and it's an exciting time, and hopefully that sets a little bit of the landscape. So whatever you do, whether you're somebody that participates in the walk to end Alzheimer's, the longest day, an advocate, volunteering in a clinical trial, sharing your story with your friends and your family, uh, you are helping move the cause forward ultimately to where we want to get to with that first survivor. Uh, and as we move forward. And so I know hopefully this set the stage a little bit as we think about this disease and the underlying biology and where we are with the idea that there is a lot happening and I know there's a lot of details that we might get into more with some of our discussion. Thank you so much. That was such great information. Um, let, let's dive into some of the specifics of what we were discussing. So you were talking about some of the causes. Can you expand a little bit more on the causes of Alzheimer's and how we might prevent it? If, if we're seeing things 20 years before, what are these causes we might be able to prevent? Yeah, so when we think about causes, you know, we don't know that there's one single cause, but there really is this intersection throughout life that there may be things that are contributing to our risk. So we do know that there is a genetics component that if you have a, a parent uh, that had or has Alzheimer's, for instance, you are at a greater risk. But there's actually been over 100 different kind of variations of genes that have been identified as being associated with either increased risk as well as some that have been associated with decreased risk. And we don't completely understand the role that all of those play. So while it may be an increased risk, it is certainly not a guarantee, right, in, in terms of, of thinking about that. Throughout the life course, there are also contributions in, in terms of our cardiovascular health or metabolic health. We do see that there are, um, there's an increased risk for people with heart disease and diabetes, for instance. And so manage your numbers, know your numbers, do things to manage those, be physically active. There seems to be a linkage with being physically engaged, finding something you're going to do and keep doing, uh, and that it never seems to be too late to start, that there's a benefit of, of engaging in physical exercise uh, or physical activity that gets your, your, um, your heart pump, your blood pumping through your body, even if you're already experiencing cognitive um, uh, challenges. So, for instance, there was a study this past summer that was presented that was in people with mild cognitive impairment, uh, so all cause, not just mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's, but individuals that had those early memory changes. Uh, and they tested, they evaluated aerobic exercise compared to strength training. And they actually found that in the interventions that they did not see individuals decline uh, as they would have maybe expected one of the groups potentially to do, suggesting that it's really that getting active. So certainly need to see that um, in, a, in a larger study with, with more diverse participants, but it's really that first kind of head-to-head -head comparison uh, in that population that we've seen. So exciting to, to know there are things we can do wherever we might be. It, 
the same advice that keeps us healthy everywhere seems to keep our brain healthy too then, right? The, it's the same yeah. healthy. Gets our healthy. brains are part of our body. We don't always, you know, we sort of think sometimes like, well, here's all the stuff to keep, but it's really, it's the, they're all connected and they're all intertwined. Our brain is the command center. So let's do right. what we can to keep right. it as healthy as we can. That's a good reminder. You know, you mentioned biomarkers. Can you explain a little bit about more about what those are and how they've helped in the field of Alzheimer's research? Yeah, so a biomarker is a, a measure of biological change. So things that we might be more used to talking about when we talk about biomarkers are like insulin levels with diabetes or um, cholesterol is a, is a pseudo biomarker, but cholesterol levels as it relates to heart disease could be, you know, in that, uh, in that vein as well. So in Alzheimer's disease, there's a lot of work going on in trying to identify what are the earliest biologies and how can we detect them accurately and consistently in individuals. And so there's a lot of work around some of the biology specific to Alzheimer's, beta amyloid and tau, for instance, but there's others looking at certain immune markers, looking at certain markers of cell death, because as the disease progresses, that's what's happening. Some of these brain cells are dying. Can you measure those changes? And if you see less, based in a, in a particular intervention, is that having a benefit on, on some of that you know, progression? What does that look like? And so there's some work going on in that. And that's just in Alzheimer's. But actually, if you look at Lewy body dementias and Parkinson's disease dementia, there's some uh, work going on is can you measure one of their primary biologies is a, is a, a clumping of protein known as alpha-synuclein that forms a very specific brain change. Can you measure that over time and, and start to see some of those changes? So there's looking at really this idea you could imagine a future where we will get to having a series of different types of, of tests that if something's, you know, maybe there's a signal that something's not right, trying to get more definitive uh, follow-up. Again, very much like how we think about cancer treatment today or cancer diagnosis today um, or uh, heart disease today. We're moving in that direction. That's great. Um, yeah, prevention obviously is like a, a big focus of knowing when it's happening. You shared a lot about 140 different therapies or whatever, all these different treatments coming what can you tell us about the current treatments that are FDA approved? I know you said they're targeting the underlying biology, but how much can they slow down the progression of the disease? Yeah, so there are, there are actually three different classes, if you will, of drugs that have been approved um, uh, uh, for, by the FDA at this point in time. So there are cholesterase, cholinesterase inhibitors, so that's like the Aricept and Epizel. Um, as, as one example, there's the glutamate moderators or Nemenda, um, I think is, is the primary example. And then there is these MABs that are the mono, one of the monoclonal antibodies targeting beta amyloid. So let me just talk through those a little bit more. So cholinesterase inhibitors, uh, one of the, and glutamate moderators, they have some, although opposite in, in context, they have similar ways of, um, of working is that as the disease progresses, the brain cells are dying, as I, as I mentioned. And so they're really helping as the brain cells die, there's maybe less, they're further apart, they turn up the volume so that the brain cells can talk to one another longer. So not unlike a hearing aid, right? So as hearing loss progresses, right, you can continue to turn up the volume on a, on a hearing aid to help uh, with that communication. Eventually, the loss may become to the point beyond the capability of, of those particular, of the tools that you might be using, whether it be these drugs or, or a hearing aid, as an example. Um, there is no evidence that they're stopping or slowing the underlying progression of the disease. They are truly treating the symptoms. They're helping a person maintain function and, and, and some level of cognition for a longer period of time. Uh, as, as they go forward. It is important to note that not everybody um, has the same benefit or, or, or impact of these medications. It's really a, based on where they might be in the disease progression, their particular circumstances. And so it's something to very much discuss with their healthcare provider about whether these are right for them or for you um, in, in where you might be in the progression and, um, uh, and, and also understand what the potential impact or benefit may be for you. Some of them have side effects like GI side effects, some of them are available in um, pill form, in patch form, in liquid form. So again, part of why there's such a discussion that needs to happen. The monoclonal antibodies uh, targeting beta amyloid. I saw someone say the drugs all end in, in MAB, and so I'm going to just add that. I'm going to answer that one while we are, are talking uh, here. So these are it's because they're monoclonal antibodies, which I think we've heard a lot about in the last two years with COVID, right? And and how they're made and what they are. And um, so they are uh, they can be delivered either as an infusion or um, one of the other ones that was tested was a, a, an injection in the skin, um, although they were, that particular one reported it, it didn't see a, um, a benefit in their top line results. 
Um, so that, that's why they're all, they all end in MAV. They are targeting beta amyloid with the idea that, that if they're, and the uh, data when, they, when they've mapped it out, um, the totality of evidence, in, in, in the cases where the uh, beta amyloid is reduced, there seems to be a benefit uh, in terms of the, the um, less clinical decline in those individuals over a period of time. And it, th these are not cures. These are um, having a, 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 a modest benefit on these individuals. But again, uh, what we hear very clearly from families and individuals that are living with Alzheimer's is that a modest benefit of a few months being maintained in an, in an earlier phase of the disease when they may have um, the ability to maintain their independence a little bit longer. But when you have the impact of lowering beta amyloid, there, there seems to be, at least in the clinical trials, there seems to be clinical benefit on the individuals. Now, I think your question was, you know, what does that really mean? And, and that's the idea of this, the combination is that there's a lot of different biologies at work. And so this is one biology that we can, we have these potential drugs, one's approved, others are in the pipeline that are targeting that one biology. But there are other things going on, and we need to have tools that allow us to impact that biology. So again, very much think about cancer, that when you think about interventions of cancer, there are different ways based on a particular biology of a, cancer, a given cancer, the location of where it is, where you might target different biologies in that person. There might be a combination approach, right? It's that same kind of idea. Based on the biology, can we move forward? So these are really exciting firsts in our space, but they are the first, and they're gonna to lead to the second and the third and us going forward across the board. Yeah, I think it's helpful that you shared like all the different causes. Like I've always thought of it as it's like this one thing, it's not. And so I think that's helpful to understand. I get it. Different medications do different things and will help different people. Um, so well, that's- Janet, helpful. think about our brains. Our brains are, I mean, I'm, I'm moving my hands. You're moving your hands. We're talking, we're breathing. We're, you know, um, we're engaging in a conversation. All of that, we're blinking, we're swallowing. We're, you know, all yeah. of those are yeah. really driven by our brains. Our brains are a complex organ that does incredible things throughout our entire lives. So when disease is present, it's a complex disease to impact the brain as well. With all these therapies that are in trials, two questions actually. The first one, is there anything on the horizon for prevention? And is there anything that's gonna help people living with Alzheimer's right now? Or is it just trials? Yeah, so let's start with the first one in terms of prevention. So I mentioned just in passing at the end um, of, of my comments, uh, my opening comments, that there's a lot of really exciting things going on around risk reduction as we think about risk reduction. And in fact, I'm, I'm really particularly proud of one of those studies called US Pointers, the Alzheimer's Association is one of the leads along with folks at Wake Forest University and, and other institutions across the country that are evaluating uh, very specific recipes of, of, of behavioral interventions, so risk reduction strategies being combined in a very specific way, things around nutritional guidance, physical exercise, health coaching and, and monitoring, cognitive engagement, social engagement as well, and, and really putting those together in very specific recipes, either self-guided or structured, in individuals that are thought to be at an increased risk uh, for a two-year intervention to say what's the impact on cognition. Now this study, US Pointer, is, uh, is, is the largest study of its kind in scope and scale in the world. And it really builds off of work that's come before. It's built off of a study in Finger in, uh, in Finland called Finger, the Finnish Intervention Geriatric Study, where they saw in a smaller group, a more homogeneous population, that those that engaged in a, in a combined risk reduction strategy compared to usual care had a benefit on cognition after two years of intervention, right? So they've continued to follow those individuals on over time, and they have, they've, they've continued to see a benefit of those that engaged in that specific recipe. So taking that to a larger and more diverse population is what U.S. Pointer is looking to do. So we're in five, five communities across the country, Rhode Island, Chicago, Houston, uh, Wake Forest in North Carolina, Winston-Salem, uh, and Northern California in Sacramento, evaluating in communities within over 30% participants from diverse and underrepresented populations to say, what's the impact of these risk reduction strategies in individuals? And actually we've been, that's funded, the parent study is fully funded by the Alzheimer's Association because this is such a big question we all have. But we've actually, with the increase in federal funding, been able to get additional resources to say, can we take a picture of the brain? What's the impact on the biology of these interventions as well? What are we changing about the biology? And so that's really, I think, exciting to, to see that work go forward. As of today, the things you can do are, you know, your overall health, right? Think about your heart health, learn new things, continue to 
use and use your brain, stay engaged, stay involved, engage in things that are, you know, going to challenge you or, you know, get your heart pumping, whatever that might be. It could be walking, it could be dancing, it could be swimming, it could be um, lots of different things depending on you. And of course, before you take on any new exercise, have that conversation with your healthcare provider. Your second question. <laughs> yeah, I gave you to remind harder. everyone. <laughs> um, people you who want are to remind everyone what is yeah, people who are living with Alzheimer's right now, uh, there's a lot of trials going on. Are treatments years away because they're still in trial or are there things coming quickly for the people that are living with Alzheimer's right this minute? So as we think about Alzheimer's, you know, I talked about it as a continuum, right? So it, de it somewhat depends on where in that continuum somebody may be. So some of the, the treatments that I mentioned, particularly the, um, the MABs, uh, some of those are really being tested in people that are in that earlier stages. So mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's or mild Alzheimer's disease. There are other ongoing trials that are in the late stage that are looking at um, moderate, mild to moderate, uh, and, and more advanced disease as well. Again, across that entire continuum, you may have different outputs. You know, so you might be looking at, can we impact cognition? Can we improve co uh, quality of life? Can we impact um, some of the non-cognitive symptoms that a person may be experiencing? So there's lots of different work that's going on uh, in that space. There's also work going on in, in kind of in what we would call the psychosocial space. So for instance, if you are um, receiving care, you, you need, you're going to an emergency room. How do we improve that experience? So there's a lot of work going on in that space as well, again, across that entire continuum so that individuals both have the, the care, the resources, wherever they may be, and that we're really, um, as a community, as a society, more uh, moving towards more dementia capable. Got it. Uh, last question before we go to our Q&A. What is giving you the most hope? Oh, there's so much. To, I mean, I think that's why, and I hope that came through in, in the comments and even in our back and forth, Janet, yeah. there is so much. And I think so it's, much the fact that it's fascinating to it's me. It's yeah. not any one thing. And I, you know, I think we often hear, we see in the headlines, this or that, and actually it's all of it. And I hope that's the message that all of you see. Yeah. There's so much going on in tools for early and accurate diagnosis. You know, even without an intervention, early and accurate diagnosis allow you to plan, allow you to work, do things with your family in a new way, allow you to have that conversation, plan for your own care future, you know, all of those types of things. Take that trip you've always wanted that maybe have been putting off. I actually sat next to a couple on a plane, coincidentally, and they, so they, they were on their way somewhere, and they said, well, actually, our, the, the wife had just been diagnosed. And they said, we've been putting this off, we've been putting this off, and this is where we're going. And I said, well, actually... I'm a scientist and I, I work on Alzheimer's disease. And so we had a very lively discussion for the rest of the flight, as I'm sure you can imagine. But that was a reminder to me that it's, it's you know, it's, it's those types of things that an early and accurate diagnosis help with. But it's also this incredible diversity in the pipeline. And I see it firsthand in my role. As I mentioned, the association has a program called Part the Cloud that is funding, actively funding phase one and phase two, those early stage trials in accelerating them forward. And just the diversity of what's happening, the innovation that what's happening in that space, you know, both new drugs, new things that have been developed um, that are being evaluated, but also really creative things about saying this is a biology. And in fact, this was something that was developed for, um, that was developed for cancer. And at a lower dose, it has this impact on this biology and we can test it as a potential treatment. The biology makes sense. You know, if we, if we change this and this, it doesn't have the same impact, it doesn't do this, but actually here's the impact on the biology that we know is important in disease. So there's a lot of that kind of momentum. Wow, that's great. Yeah, it sounds like so much hope. It's, it's, it's mind blowing, it's fantastic. Like you, we don't realize all this is going on. So thank you for sharing that. If we could pop up the slide of all the social media links, I wanna show everyone the places you can learn more about Dr. Snyder and the Alzheimer's Association. And you could screen capture it, or remember, we're going to send you this. So you're going to get a recording of this to share with your family, your loved ones, refer to later. But these are places where you can uh, like and follow. And now it's time to hear from all of you. So we welcome your questions. Uh, Jonathan wants to know, what are the signs when someone would qualify for brain imaging versus a blood test? 
Yeah, it's a great question. And, and I, I think it's important to recognize kind of where these tools are today. So there are tools that are uh, available in, in terms of imaging, and there's different kinds of imaging. So, you know, one of the things that's looking at the underlying biology might be PET imaging that's looking at specifically beta amyloid, and, and there's three agents that have been approved for that. Uh, and one for tau. Um, they're not approved as diagnostics for Alzheimer's, though. They're approved for looking at the biology, and so that's a really important distinction. Uh, and at this point in time, the Alzheimer's Association had put together, uh, with the Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging, appropriate use guidelines and recommendations for their use. And it's really in only specific instances where, where it's going to improve the certainty of a diagnosis, right, and help in the, in the certainty of a diagnosis for an individual. Now, blood tests are coming soon, and they're coming fast. And so actually this past summer at the Alzheimer's Association's International Conference, which is the largest convening of dementia scientists, we had, a, we had about 10,000 people from 99 countries, 10,000 scientists and researchers from 99 countries coming together to share the latest on science. And one of those was appropriate use recommendations on blood tests. So where are we in terms of thinking about research, thinking about specialty care, and thinking about primary care? So in research, we are absolutely seeing just tremendous uptake, and it's really, it, it's, it's happening fast, right, in, in these tools being used, these blood tests being used. In specialty care, there might be certain places that they're being used, um, particularly when there, there might be a need and, and there's a clear understanding of where they are. The recommendations were in primary care. We're not quite there yet uh, in terms of really understanding what these tools are telling us and what they might mean for an individual in, in, in the progression. So just to maybe give a little bit of landscape of, of where all of they are. There's a lot happening. There's a lot of momentum. It is, it's exciting, but not all of them are necessarily um, in all of our doctor's offices across the country, and there's appropriate, appropriate in terms of the, the, the benefit uh, for clinical care where they, where they may be applied. Got it. All right, we have another question coming in from Karen. How do we get involved in a clinical trial? That's love that question. I love that question, Karen. And actually, I was, um, I was uh, in uh, uh, Rochester, New York last week. I think I saw someone in the chat say Rochester. And that was a question that I had a chance to meet, just an incredible couple that um, have been married for 45 years, and she's an active participant in the trial. And they share that their passion for doing it is that you know, they have children and they, they, want, they want to see a change. They, they hope she benefits from whatever treatment's being tested, but they really want to see a change in the future for their children and their, their future grandchildren. So clinical trials, the Alzheimer's Association has, um, one of the things we heard very loud and clear from our constituents was how challenging it was to find trials. And there are so many different kinds. They're not all drug trials. There are trials for care interventions, for risk reduction strategies, online studies that you can participate in, um, surveys around perceptions of disease, et cetera. And putting that together in a, in a tool that's relatively easy to use. So we launched something called Trial Match um, or Alzheimer's Association Trial Match, and I'll put it in the chat in a moment. Um, but what this is, is it's essentially like a match.com for clinical trials, if you will, right? You fill out your profile and then it tells you what might be going on in your community. And again, this is not just for individuals that are living with Alzheimer's or another dementia. It's, it's the full, um, this can be people providing care, people that are just concerned, people that um, think that they're at a higher risk, you know, uh, individuals that say, I just, hey, follow me for time to see what might be the changes that happened to me or I can be a participant in some way. So there's a lot of different kinds of things that are out there, uh, different ways to get involved. And I'll put the link in the chat. Oh, actually, I can't put the link in the chat, but I will chat it to Brookdale, and they will put the link in the chat. Perfect. <laughs> um, so, you know, as an opportunity to find what might be happening in your community. Or if you're um, the person that's living with dementia is maybe in a different community, or you have siblings in different communities that might be interested, you, they can find what might be going on in their, in their area. Okay, here's a great one from Joyce. Does eliminating sugars, increasing exercise, and increasing MCT oil reduce cognitive impairment? Great question, Joyce. And I, I wish I could tell you that there was one, you know, one kind of specific thing that was going to, particularly from a nutritional piece, right? Um, there was one specific thing that was going to be able to reduce risk and that we knew that definitively. Um, Unfortunately, we don't know that. But what we do know is that, for instance, one of the other studies that we saw reported out at this past summer's Alzheimer's Association's International Conference looked at ultra-processed foods and suggested that individuals that had uh, ultra-processed foods that made up a certain component, you know, amount of their diet were at an increased risk. And so those are changes we might be able to make in our diet that may impact or lower our risk. 
So, you know, that might be on, a, on an individual level, it may or may not have an impact, but on a population level, that's where we're going to see, you know, an impact on those types of things. Same with physical exercise. The studies suggest that on a population basis, engaging in physical exercise and staying active, there's a, a benefit to that. Um, and that's why studies like U.S. Pointer are so important. It's the goal is that hopefully they're going to give us much more guidance in, you know, what are those specific things we have to do? What are the specific aspects within nutrition or within physical exercise that we need to do to reduce our risk? And, and what does that look like? And, and so we don't have all the answers, but that's really where it comes down to, you know, eat a balanced diet, make sure you're getting your nutrients from your food, you know, low saturated fats, reduce sugars. Those are all things that um, have been shown to be beneficial in reducing risk. Um, you know, engage in exercise and, and those types of things as well. That's great. Again, everything that makes us healthy in our body makes us healthy in our brain. So um, here I have two questions that are very similar. Um, one person says a family member is recently diagnosed. What symptoms other than memory loss can we expect to see? And someone else is similarly saying, what's the biggest lifestyle change I can expect to see when caring or living with someone suffering from Alzheimer's or dementia? Yeah, so we're both great. Um, uh, these questions, I'm seeing them come through, and there's a ton, so I don't know that we'll get to all of them, but we'll try. We'll keep trying. Um, but the, you know, I think the first question is, I would direct you to a resource on the association's website, alz.org backslash 10 signs. Uh, and the reason is, is that there, you know, it, there might be one thing that one person would notice, and something else that another person might notice. So it's really something that's a change, right? In that, in that you've always been doing. So an example, I am. Um, I a lot of people make fun of me for this, but I love my paper register for my check book and I still balance my checkbook with a paper register and I've had people be like there's an app for that but I like my paper register it, it gives me comfort I do it every week I always have I don't imagine myself stopping my husband has never done that ever I he couldn't do it 10 years ago he couldn't do it today and he's not gonna be able to do it in 10 years so for him the ability to not do that isn't going to be a sign that there's an issue going on for me as someone that's done it weekly for years, for decades, and plan to keep doing it, when I have, if I have issues with that, if that becomes a challenge for me, that's a change in something that I've done over a long period of time, right? So it's not so much forgetting where your car keys are. I don't even know where mine are right now, but it's actually forgetting what they're for, right? It's that kind of thing. It's a change in those types of things. But some people, it might be visual perception. I met somebody in Dallas once that told me he was an executive. He said it was word retrieval that his challenge, that he had challenges in terms of he was writing memos to his team and it was actually word retrieval. He'd have to call his wife and say, what's that thing that tells time that's got the hands? And it was a clock, right? It was, thing, you know, it's that kind of thing. And so uh, it can be different for everybody. I saw somebody already put the 10 signs in there, which is great. Um, so, you know, that's a, that's a place to go for. And then the other question was around what is the biggest lifestyle change that you'd expect when you're providing yeah. care? Yeah, so similarly, other than memory loss, what are the big lifestyle changes uh, to expect? A any tips from you as well as, they, as they're living with and caring for somebody who, who has Alzheimer's? Yeah, it really does depend on on where someone might be in the progression, right? And and them their them their them as an individual as well. So you know, I, for instance, and in, uh, for our grandmother, it was there was a, a progression, and um, she actually fed herself very for a long period of time, um, even when she was in the very advanced stages and and was no longer mobile. Um, still, that was that was something that she maintained and, and considered. For other people, that's something that may be impacted early on. So it is really um, uh, dependent on the individual. So you know, I think have that conversation with your healthcare provider. Have that conversation. Call the 800 number. Share more about your specific circumstances and ask for those kinds of tools. And I will say, wandering is an issue that we hear from many people. For instance, getting lost. If, if you know, particularly that individuals experience those. And we do have tools and resources on our website, and that's just the ALZ.org. That is the, the front part of the next two, um, uh, that the last two uh, links that were shared. There's a lot of resources on there about, you know, different ways or different tools of supporting somebody that's living with dementia. And again, our 1-800 number, 1-800-272-3900. It's on the website as well. You can access that and reach out for your specific circumstance so that we can give you tools and resources that can help you in your care. That's great. Um, we just popped that in the chat as well. Okay. When can you start taking medications for Alzheimer's and can you take them as a preventive measure? So uh, um, 
to the first question, that's really a conversation with your healthcare provider based on you, your other medications, your other conditions, your overall health. So that's that's a that's a, a discussion that should be very specific to you or your, or your um, the individual's health and, and health considerations. In terms of prevention, there's no evidence that that these are beneficial for prevention, and in fact, there are side effects and other considerations that come into play. Um, for instance, the colonic inhibitors, there's no there's no um, indicator that they're stopping or slowing the, the underlying biology, right? So you wouldn't necessarily um, expect an impact. And then the, there there are side effects; they're not approved for that use, etc. Um, in terms of some of the drugs that are in trials right now, there are actually trials that are called prevention trials that are in individuals that, for instance, might have the biology but not yet, not yet experience the cognition. To answer that question, to say, are these things that perhaps we can do earlier on if we have this particular profile that may be able to impact the changes in cognition? So we don't know the answer to that, but that is actively being tested and evaluated. Once you've been diagnosed, how quick is the decline for most people and how long can you live with the disease? Yeah, so it, you know, I, 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 I'm sorry that this is the answer I keep saying, but it, so it does depend. So the averages that we see are four to eight years for individuals from the time of diagnosis, but some individuals are diagnosed in the much earlier stages. It could be longer. Other individuals have other um, health conditions that may make it faster. So it's very dependent on the individual. So it's hard to give you a specific number. Yeah. Uh, it can yeah. be up to 30 years. And so it, it's very... Um, there, there's a number of different variables that come into play, but the average in, in terms of reporting from diagnosis based on if you look at Medicare and Medicaid claims data um, is four to eight years. Got it. All right, here's a, here's a question I love. What are the best kind of computer games to help stave off dementia? So similarly, I wish I could give you that specific recipe, right, in, in where we are. I think it's the same kind of thing as, like, do something that you enjoy doing that's using your brain, that's stretching your brain, that's teaching you new things, and continue to do it. Um, and while we don't have any evidence on any particular game, there have been, um, there have been uh, I think there was one, one large study or there's been a, a handful of studies that have been uh, smaller in number that have said suggested a benefit or suggested an impact. You know, I think now we're seeing them incorporated or being incorporated into large-scale clinical trials to really evaluate that impact. So we don't have that, that kind of specific tool, but do what you like to do, do what you enjoy doing, do what's going to stretch your brain, do what's going to keep you engaged, keep you active, and, and that's really, at this point in time, what, what we can tell you. All right, here's a great question from Tom. Do we see similar conditions in animals, or is this unique to humans? Yeah, so um, there are a couple animals that do experience um, cognitive issues or cognitive changes. Um, not all of them uh, are the same as Alzheimer's, for instance. But you know, there are there are some there is some work, for instance, in dogs, and I think I heard recently cats that um, you you can see this, but it's not quite the same. Um, and part of that's because of the complexity of of the human brain and, and some of the differences in the human brain compared to um, others. Here's a, here's a really good question. It's, it's one I know we all want to know. It's, as Alzheimer's progresses, does the person who has it suffer? Great question. And, you know, I mean, I think that's why there's so much work on how can we improve and support the quality of life throughout. And so there are things that, you know, benefit in quality of life and ensuring um, that throughout those experiences, engagement and continuing to be engaged and to be part of the community or part of a community and, and activities and things like that and how to address that. And, um, you know, I, I think that's really where a lot of that work comes into to ensure that really there's that high quality of life throughout the entire disease progression. Are there any initiatives for having brain MRI scans covered by Medicare for diagnosing any early onsets of cognitive declines? Yeah, so maybe let me break that down a little bit because I'm not completely sure I understand the question in the context. So um, oftentimes you'll see an MRI that's used as part of the process of a diagnosis because it's often a rule out. So you're really looking for some vascular changes, white matter, what we call white matter hyperintensities or, or other things that may be changing in the vascular the, the vascular processes in the brain. Um, to rule out that that's actually a contributor to the symptoms that an individual may experience. And I, that is something that is, is part of routine care, routine, you know, not care, routine um, kind of diagnosis that you'll often see that as part of it. Some of the imaging that I'm talking about more is like PET scanning. So it's the, it's looking at specific brain changes like the beta amyloid um, and the um, uh, uh, tau protein, for instance, but there are also lots of other things that are being developed. 
uh, and as and this is why I think this might be the question that the person is is actually asking is that as of today, while there are several of those agents that are approved by the FDA, uh, the Food and Drug Administration in the United States, they're not readily covered, um, particularly the beta amyloid images, and it's, it's covered under something called coverage with evidence development. So only in the instances of particular studies and initiatives that are collecting a different, additional coverage or additional ever evidence about the impact of those are they being covered within clinical care. Um, the Alzheimer's Association is actually leading, uh, they, uh, leading the idea study and now the new idea study, which is, is really um, the initiatives are to collect additional evidence for the impact of amyloid imaging uh, on care and, and what that is. And so I referenced very right, at a high level in, in my comments, but that these tools have been shown that when you have an accurate diagnosis, when you're more certain of your diagnosis, um, that there's an improvement in care, there's a change in care planning, and that's what we've been able to see in these studies. And, and I should note, IDEAS was in 18,000 individuals. It's the largest study of its kind in our space, and, and New IDEAS is now taking place in over 7,000 individuals. Again, to collect that evidence that would say having this type of tool available to us as part of the diagnostic workup in instances where it will support the diagnostic process changes and improves care. You know, and I think your point that, look, getting an accurate diagnosis so that you can attack it the right way is smart. We have a question from somebody here that says, from Brianne, who says, my mom's 71. She has mild cognitive impairment diagnosed for about five years. I'm 43-year-old female. What tests, evaluations, what should I advocate for myself in the near future? Or is it too early for that? Yeah, so I think there's different things. So, um, you know, to the, the question around my mom or, you know, and I, or your mom and, and might have mild cognitive impairment, I think having that com continued conversation with your healthcare provider ensure that they know they are aware of the where things are. There are a lot of causes of mild cognitive impairment. It's not necessarily Alzheimer's disease, right? There could be other things going on. Ensuring that she has a, a full workup and trying to understand what might be impacting the cognition uh, in your mom is, is certainly, if and maybe that's already happened or already taken place. Um, and then I think it's some of the same things, right? There are studies, the, the study I talked about from this past summer that suggests being physically active is still beneficial, uh, or like, you know, it, it suggests that it's still beneficial and continuing to find ways of engagement and, and what that looks like. But it's have that conversation with your healthcare provider, know what your baseline is and, and go forward. Um, Janet, to your question around, you know, what should you be doing? I think it's the same, you know, be aware, but is there any particular test right now that's going to tell you? Unfortunately, no, we're, we're not quite that far back in, in that timeline of, of where things are. And we're, a lot of this is still very much in the research phase as we try to understand what it really means and what it really tells you. Uh, and, and there's a lot of considerations around all of those different pieces. And, and I think that's where, you know, participate in a clinical trial. Like, you know, fine, if there's something right for you, we're seeing trials move younger and younger, which is as we're moving kind of back in that, that timeline of, of possible um, con contributions to, to life risk, what that looks like. So participating in a clinical trial is certainly something, but I'd say at, continue to advocate for resources for families, for increased research funding. That's an opportunity for you to get engaged. If this is a journey you've had with your family, tell your story, continue to raise awareness in your community. You know, it's not something that we should be putting behind closed doors. We should be talking about these experiences. We should be ensuring that families have the resources they need, access to information. The science tells us actually that families that have access to resources, the Alzheimer's Association, I saw Diane wrote AARP, you know, in your community that has access to these resources, there are better outcomes overall for the individual, but also to the family. So there, there's a couple of questions coming in too about caregivers, right? So one of them, Pat wants to know what resources are available to help caregivers navigate all these possible treatments and drugs? Yeah, so again, that's, that's a place where the Alzheimer's Association, you might have your community area on aging, ARP, there's a lot of resources that are available. So you can access and link to, we link to all of them. So through alz.org, there's a lot of resources for caregivers. And of course, we do know that sometimes it's reading information, but there's also online virtual ways of communicating. There might be support groups in your community. Not everyone can physically come. I think that's one of the things that we, we learned through the pandemic is actually we saw a huge increase in people connecting virtually uh, in a new way and in, in, in providing support to one another within the community. So that's an opportunity. And of course, when in those instances, when you have questions, when you're trying to navigate a particular situation, you can always reach out to the call center, the 1-800-272-3900. Share your instances, ask for advice. There's a master's uh, level trained clinician always on staff, always on site to help address that and, and talk, talk that through with the family. That's great. That's great. Thank you so much. 
you know, we're up at time. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Dr. Schneider, I wanna thank you guys for all your great questions. We also ask you to join us on January 18th, 2023 at 11 a.m. for our next webinar to learn more about the upside of downsizing. Okay, downsizing doesn't have to be scary. It can be a great opportunity to sift through your memories, connect with your kids and define your legacy. So join us for a conversation with Matt Paxton, host of PBS TV's The Legacy List about decluttering, dealing with family heirlooms, options for digitizing memories and more as you prepare for that next chapter of your life. And each of our webinars features a different subject. So visit brookdale.com slash in the know to discover more. And we do hope to see you again soon. And until next time, we hope you stay safe, happy, and well. Thank you so much.